Hi class, welcome to the second uh, metaphysics video. Uh, we are following up on the philosophy of George Berkeley, uh, who um, propounded the theory of I metaphysical idealism. And now we're looking at the metaphysics and the epistemology of John Locke. You will remember John Locke from our ethics unit. Um, Locke is most famous for his natural rights theory. Um, Locke's uh, labor theory of uh, property and his um, Lockean proviso and his natural rights theory um, truly uh, influenced the founding fathers, thinkers like Jefferson and Madison in um, uh, some really important ways. Um, Locke is really the progenitor of natural rights theory um, and uh, did some influential work in his um, second treatise on government uh, when it came to um, how a how a uh, government that respects natural rights should or would look. Um, but what we're going to be concerned with in this video is uh, John Locke's um, metaphysics and his epistemology. Locke was a 17th century uh, thinker uh, for the most part. He actually um, does his work before Berkeley. Uh, so Berkeley is reacting to Locke in a lot of ways. A uh, couple of things to keep in mind with respect to Locke, um, to give you some context, remember that Locke is um, not only famous for his two treatises on government, but also for his essay concerning human understanding, and also his letter on toleration. Um, and I, I would say that Locke's ideas, um, Locke's works faithfully embody the spirit of the revolution of 1688 in England, which is partly why most of his works appear within a few years of 1688. Um, Locke is an empiricist, meaning he believes in the doctrine, and here I'm quoting uh, Bertrand Russell, a great 20th century philosopher, he believes in the doctrine that all of our knowledge, with the possible exception of logic and mathematics, is derived from experience and that there are no innate ideas or principles that are uh, written on the first draft, the blank slates of our mind at birth. So empiricism is the idea that um, knowledge is derived from experience. Now, a lot of people get this wrong. A lot of people, including folks like Steven Pinker, accuse Locke of saying that we're blank slates in the sense that we don't come into the world with any hardware that we don't come into the world um, with any predispositions, with any instincts, with any um, innate knowledge whatsoever, right? Because um, one challenge that you could level against the blank slate theory is the idea, well, look at um, a fawn, uh, a baby deer when it's born. It already has certain knowledge. It starts walking as soon as it's born. How could Locke ever claim that um, we're blank slates at birth? That's not at all what Locke is saying. Um, Locke is saying that we aren't born, we don't come into this world at birth having any innate ideas, principles, or knowledge of that sort at birth. So the mind at birth is a tabula rasa, it's a blank slate or tablet or blank tablet um, in the sense that we don't come into the world um, with any ideas or principles, um, we might have certain um, uh, features that are um, unique to our human nature. We see the, uh, we perceive the world in three dimensions. Um, we ha uh, creatures of our type have rational minds. Um, we have the ability to uh, wield language. Um, we have all sorts of things that um, we come prepackaged with. Locke is not denying that. If he was denying that, then think about it. His natural rights theory would make no sense at all because the entire theory is the claim that we as human beings, because of the kinds of creatures we are, come into the world um, with qualities that give us certain rights. Because we have rational minds, Right, that entails, uh, deductively, logically, that entails certain uh, rights that we would then have because of the kinds of creatures we are. Lower order creatures would not have the same rights, et cetera, et cetera. He's not claiming that uh, 
that we come into the world completely like empty buckets just to be filled up and that everything we are or become uh, is just a consequence of nurture, of socialization, of acculturation, of people filling up the bucket. Locke knew that a huge part of the equation was our nature, what we have innately. Locke's point is that um, a lot of people during his age, for example, were arguing uh, with him and saying, um, what you're saying, John Locke, makes no sense. Certain ideas like God are innate. People were saying that to Locke. We all come into the world with ideas like God. The idea of God, they would say to him, is innate, right? And they would look across cultures and say, look, there are all sorts of ways that cultures throughout the world behave, and they behave in the same way. Doesn't that prove that there are certain ideas that we all innately have? Um, and, and that sort of thing. Um, there must be universal agreement uh, concerning certain principles, and that's evidence for innate ideas. Locke's argument uh, in response was, look, even if this were true, right, even if you look across the world and you find that um, in every country around the world, uh, each country has a history of belief in supernatural deity, uh, each, um, every culture that you look at has this in common and that in common. Locke said, even if this were true, it wouldn't prove that the principles are innate, that you're actually born with those ideas in your head. Um, it only would prove that human experience is uniform, right? That we have a certain human nature that leads us through the lived experience to develop certain ideas and we're, we're born into a world that is a certain way and human interaction is a certain way and uh, we have certain psychological dispositions that lead us to all have certain ideas and cultural customs, et cetera, et cetera. It doesn't prove that the fact that we share those things doesn't prove that we're born with them, right? And Locke also said, if these principles were naturally imprinted on the mind, everyone would know them, but they don't. For example, the mentally deficient don't know these ideas that all cultures share. Um, infants, children, right? Pre-modern man, for example. So, so Locke argued that way, right? Um, but Locke's point was, is that we bring to the table perception, we bring to the table our human nature, we bring to the table our ability to apply reason to the information that we gather. So nature's a, a big part of it. And then of course, environment, experience, culture um, is another uh, big part of it. Another thing to keep in mind about Locke and here we'll uh, switch the slides here, and I'll actually deliver this argument to you. This is a more clear, concise way of putting the argument. Rationalists believe, and this is the debate between rationalism and empiricism, rationalists believe that we're born with some ideas and concepts, that they are innate. But this makes no sense, says Locke. There are no truths that are found in everyone at birth. There are no universal ideas found in people of all cultures and at all times. So everything we know must be gained, all the principles and ideas that we hold must be gained from experience, right? Interesting point, Locke really saw it as his job as a philosopher. He was really interested in, in this. Locke saw it as his job as a philosopher. He believed that his empiricism, his philosophical project was akin to Newton's physics. He wanted to create a kind of physics of the mind um, in the sense that the mind is an empty container, it's, it's, it's hardware, um, and when you have experiences, um, you're downloading certain apps uh, to it, right? He, uh, John Locke wanted to come up with a theory where he could basically, just like Newton came up with these physical atoms, which were the building blocks of matter. Atoms, right, this uh, microphone, for example, if you broke it down, um, it's divisible. If you broke it down, you would find that this is uh, a cluster of atoms uh, shaped microphone-wise, right? Uh, that there are certain building blocks of, and you can even go deeper to quarks, there are certain building blocks of matter, and atoms are those building blocks. John Locke thought that we could do the same thing with the mind. And he called these atoms of thought, right? Just in the same way that the world is made up of um, particles, so the mind and ideas are made up of basic building blocks. 
and uh, fundamental uh, mental particles, so to speak. And he called these, um, he called these uh, simple ideas. Uh, and let me switch slides here. And you can take a look at these quotes here from Locke. These are um, direct quotes. It seems to me a near contradiction to say that there are truths imprinted on the soul, which it perceives not. The very notion of innate ideas, says Locke, is incoherent. In order for something to be an idea at all, it has to have been present at some point in somebody's mind. So he makes a lot of good points there. And so here's where we get down to his sort of um, Newtonian ideas about the mind, right? And so Locke posited that all of our, uh, all of our ideas are derived from two sources, and you can see this uh, here. All of our ideas are derived from two sources. A, sensations, right? When you actually touch something, see something, hear something, uh, that is a sensation. And B, reflection. So that would be perceptions of the operation of our own mind, uh, which Hume actually, David Hume actually called this reflection. Locke called this internal sense. So there's a kind of mental sense, thinking about thinking, so that we call that now um, a trendy term for it is metacognition, right? When, let's say you um, touch a stove and it's hot and um, it burns your hand. You have a simple sen sensation um, and then uh, the, um, reflection of that is being aware of the fact that you just got your hand burned. Um, and, and then of course, eventually you develop the complex idea. Uh, eventually you make abstractions such that you realize that this is something that will continue to happen if you keep touching the hot stove and you learn, um, you use your reasoning mind to learn that you shouldn't touch um, a hot stove. Um, so, uh, so again, Locke believed that complex ideas, right, ideas like um, a book or even more complex ideas like um, uh, democracy, for example, right, these are uh, built up of simple ideas. So simple ideas and perceptions um, are are the building blocks of more complex ones and that that's how, that was his theory of knowledge. So as these simple ideas combine, they become more complex. And he, Locke even posited that there was a process by which you take simple ideas um, and you combine them and you do this via comparison, abstraction and combination. And this is how knowledge is formed. Before we get to how complex ideas are formed, let's look at simple ideas. Ideas are divided into two categories, ideas of primary qualities and ideas of secondary qualities. Now, this is really interesting. A lot of people disagree now with Locke about this. Barclay even disagreed with Locke. So, what we're talking about here are the simple building blocks of thought, right? The simple um, ideas that form to, um, to produce complex thoughts. So these are divided into two categories, ideas of primary qualities. These are ideas that, these are, these are things that inhere in the objects themselves. So an object's shape, its size, its divisibility, its motion, its solidity, its number, etc. Those are things that cannot be separated from the matter and are they're present in the object regardless of whether a person sees them or not. Those are primary qualities. And you can detect that, right? You can sense, this is why he calls them ideas. I wanna point out really quickly, when Locke says ideas, he's using a term that we are not used to. We think of ideas as ideas in our minds. He even refers to perceptions and sensations as ideas. So when Locke says simple ideas, what he means is perceptions and sensations and that sort of thing. Um, your, your sort of instant sense of something, right? And so his point is, look, there are simple ideas that you can have, like the shape of something, the size of something, the motion of something, something's divisibility, um, its solidity, its number. Those things are actually in the objects themselves, and he calls those primary um, primary qualities. So ideas are broken down into primary and secondary qualities. Those are primary qualities. Secondary qualities um, are actually separate from the matter itself, 
and quote, in truth are nothing in the objects themselves, but powers to produce various sensations in us by their primary qualities. So things like color, taste, sound, coldness, lightness, heat, that sort of thing. And a lot of people disagree with um, Locke on this, for example. Um, so, for example, Barclay pointed out that he was an idealist, not an empiricist, because he believed that the same thing that applies to secondary objects that they're dependent on us, right? The color of an object. So for example, how color works. Um, when light hits an object, say the object is a banana, the object absorbs some of the light and reflects the rest of it. Um, and of course, which wavelengths are reflected or absorbed depends on the properties in the object itself. So take a banana, for example. With a banana, certain wavelengths bounce back because of the way the object is constituted, the way it's composed. And these are the wavelengths of yellow light. So when you look at a banana, the wavelengths of reflected light determine what color you actually see. The light waves reflect off the banana's peel and hit the um, the uh, the cones at the, uh, the light-sensitive um, uh, part of your retina at the back of your eye. And this, of course, is delivered to your uh, brain as sense data, right? To your to the visual cortex of the brain, which processes information and returns, uh, gives you the color yellow, right? And that's why you experience the banana as yellow. Locke's point is this is a function of how your mind interacts with the object as a thing in itself. You remember that term from last lecture, um, the banana isn't yellow, it's yellow because of your interaction with it. And so that's something you actually bring to it. That's why he called something like color a secondary quality. Barclay's point is, if you really think about it, that also applies to a thing's shape, its size, its motion, its solidity, its number, etc. If this were a more advanced metaphysics class, we could spend an entire uh, semester going through this. I know it's really interesting, but I just want to now get to um, some of Locke's ideas. And here's an image of this, right? <clears throat> and so this is the difference between uh, primary and secondary qualities, okay? And so the idea is, Okay, and what uh, Locke said was, once the mind has acquired a collection of simple ideas, right, it can process them by uniting them into various combinations and repeating them or comparing them. Here's some more images for that, right? Primary qualities, you can see this chart here. Secondary qualities, does it smell, taste, and look and look like that way? Yes, well, that's perception, that's a secondary quality, fine. Now let's talk about uh, complex ideas, which obviously are just like objects like this table that I'm hitting my hand against. This table is made up of atoms. The simple building blocks of this table are atoms, just like that is the case with physical stuff. Locke believed that the simple building blocks of complex ideas uh, were simple ideas. So where do complex ideas come from? Where do we get ideas of unified objects such as books and elephants? So Locke said, while the mind cannot originate ideas, it can process those simple ideas into more complex ideas through compounding, through comparison, and through abstraction. Because your next question probably is, well, how does the mind take simple ideas, right? The, the, the sort of raw flow of experience, how do we organize those simple sensations we have into complex ideas? Um, things like uh, a horse, beauty, gratitude, an army, the universe, democracy, these really complex abstract things, um, Locke kind of explains how that works. So Locke says, take your complex idea of an apple. The idea of an apple is the combination of, of simpler ideas of red, round, sweet, how big the apple is, etc. right? So we eventually put those things together and we uh, come up with uh, the abstraction of the um, of the apple. So eventually, when we've encountered through our perception enough apples, right, and we have simple sensations, we realize that every single apple uh, is going to be to some degree or another uh, round, right? It's not completely round, but it's uh, got this sort of bumpy, uh, lumpy, 
oblong sphere spherical esque shape right i uh, don't know how to describe it but um we notice that all apples have a kind of shape we notice that um after we've experienced one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten apples, there's a stem coming out of almost all of them, right? Um, they are shiny. Uh, they all pretty much feel the same. We bite into them. There's something that um, there's something that all apples taste like. They, when you bite into it, most apples have a similar texture. They may taste differently, but you notice that uh, a Granny Smith apple is more sour, uh, but a Macintosh apple is more bitter. Uh, but the reason that they're both still apples is they do have a lot in common regardless. For example, you see a bunch of different horses. Uh, these, these ideas go all the way back to Plato, right? The idea of um, the perfect form of a horse, for example, is the thing that all horses have in common. Um, so for example, you look at a Clydesdale horse that's really big and has this fur around its feet. Uh, wait a minute, that's different than a Mustang or a Colt. That's different than a, one of those miniature horses. But you realize that all of those horses, uh, maybe it's a, um, maybe it's a, uh, a horse that's piebald, meaning it's it's uh, it's spotted, or maybe it's a black horse or a white horse or a brown horse. Even though they're all different, you realize that it has a sort of fundamental hoarseness, right? Locke's kind of going back to the ideas of Plato here and saying that when we have enough sensations, we're able to make abstractions about the things that we're seeing and perceiving. And the way that you do that, according to Locke, is through three different ways. The way you the way that you form complex ideas and abstractions, things from horses to books to um, the United States of America to um, the McDonald's Corporation to um, democracy, really abstract things, is that you take simple sensations and you do these things. You use compounding, right? So complex ideas are formed by combining or uniting together two or more simple ideas. So you build that abstraction like it's a tower from simple building blocks. You um, you come up with complex ideas by relating. Okay, so um, ideas derived from observing relations. For example, the concept of husbands um, couldn't exist without um, without a partner. Right, to be a husband is means to be someone's. Uh, married partner, for example, right? So the concept of wife reinforces the concept of husband. Uh, things like bigger and smaller, cause and effect, taller, shorter, right? Things like that. So compounding, relating, and abstracting. You take abstract ideas, books. We have an idea of a particular book. Let's say the first book you ever see as a little child. And then you have more experiences of books and you realize that books all have something in common. Maybe they all have spines. Maybe they all have pages. Um, maybe they all have a cover. Well, maybe the, the cover is torn off of this one book, but you notice it has everything else in common that the other books have. Um, they have different words on them, but they all have words inside of them. So what we do is we make abstractions in this way. We um, we abstract all the qualities that they have in common and ignore their individual distinctions. Uh, and as long as there aren't too many individual distinctions, we're able to make the abstraction and say that that item is a book and we form concepts in this way. Okay, so these are the basic ideas of John Locke. Hopefully now you have a better understanding of what empiricism means. Um, as you know from the beginning of our unit, when we started with Descartes, you know what the difference between empiricism is and rationalism. And hopefully you understand um, Locke's model of perceptions. In many ways, the next thinker that we're going to do in the next lesson um, is the philosopher Hume. Hume updates and improves on many of Locke's ideas. And I would argue that the last philosopher we're going to look at, Immanuel Kant, really brings everything together and gives us the sort of most um, modern, most impressive, most accurate uh, um, uh, version of metaphysics and epistemology that we're going to have. So thank you for listening and um, I'll see you next time with David Hume.